I have down, we were talking about phase changes. Maybe it sounds familiar to you. We're writing on the board liquids, solids, and gases. And what is it called when we transition from one phase to another? When we move from a solid phase, let's say we're moving from a solid to a liquid, and from a liquid to a gas. Well, two, two basic directions. In this one, we are adding energy. This direction, we're removing energy. Now, when you add energy to something, usually in chemistry, we think in terms of energy and heat energy. It's either going to be motion or heat. In, uh, in physics, we tend to think more about motion. In chemistry, we tend to think in terms of temperature. So as I'm adding energy to something, what is happening to the temperature? It's, it's increasing, right? So this is an increasing temperature. This would tend to be a decreasing temperature. Talk about heating and negative heating. He negative heating we call cooling. Okay? And that there are transitions here as we go from solids to liquids and liquids to solids and from liquids to gas and from gas to liquids. We give them some common names. Moving from a solid to a liquid. Think in just terms of ice and water. That's the one we tend to think of. It's the most common molecule that we deal with all the time. As we're going from a solid to a liquid, what would, be, what would solid water look like? Ice, okay? So we call this ice, and we generally just call liquid water, water. Common name, right? They're all H2O, but ice, water, and water vapor are the common names we use for H2O in the three different phases. The solid phase, the liquid phase, and gas phase. Going from a solid to a liquid, that process we call melting. Okay. And from a liquid to a gas, as it moves from being a liquid to becoming a gas, it's evaporiz right, evaporization or evaporating. We have moved from a gas to a liquid, condensing. And moving from liquid to a solid, freezing. Now, in any one of those movements, do we alter the chemical structure of water? Is it, H, is it stop being H2O and become something else? Do we break any bonds and make any bonds? No. This is just simply H2O molecules, which tend to come together, clean together, but they're in different phases. In one phase, they're solid. Liquid and gas. We talked about this with regard to the kinetic theory of matter. That how we're going to understand these molecules in relationship to one another is based upon the amount of energy they have and the assumption, and, and actually we we'll say the fact, that molecules are constantly in motion. Remember I used the imagery of my hands together for solids? And I said that solids, even though a solid like this podium, this book, this marker, this whiteboard, appear not to be moving, that they actually, the, at the molecular level, they are moving. For solids, we tend to call that motion what? What is solid motion called? Or motion of solids, molecules in a solid. I did this, right? They're vibrating. Vibrating. So solids... The constituent parts, whether element, if it's an element, they're atoms or molecules. They're moving back and forth, but they're vibrating. Because we talked about theoretically, when does all motion stop? At absolute zero, right? Because there is no volume and there is no latent energy. And so we really don't understand how that can be possible. But anywhere except there, the theoretical absolute zero, there's motion. Even though it's solid to us, there's motion. And the reason why this podium doesn't walk across the floor, I remember I said those old-fashioned football games where you put the vibrator on it and the, the whole table shakes, you put little men on it, and they move around long before LEDs, okay, long before video games. Actually, I put the little men on there and form them up and turn them on and watch them move. Okay, 
The reason why the podium here doesn't vibrate and move across the floor is because there's contra contrary vibrations taking place. When one molecule is moving this way, there are other ones moving in other directions. And the net of the whole is no motion. So the whole doesn't move, but the individual parts do. They vibrate and move relative to one another. So solids are moving with this kind of a motion, this vibration. And then what did I do when I went to liquids? What's my hand motion for liquids? Do you remember? I kind of do the sticky hands. And I'll do this. You know, when, during this module and maybe other ones, when I talk about solids, I'll just kind of do this to remind you, hey, they're in motion, but they're vibrating. But when I talk about liquids, and I might talk about liquid H2O or liquid H2O2 or liquid nitrogen or liquid, you know, other elements, I'll use this kind of motion. This is to remind you that the molecules are s and atoms are in motion. They're in much greater motion than the vibration of a solid. Now, they're not free and moving around like a gas. Kind of look like I'm trying to do some funky dance up here, right? Oh, Dad, you're embarrassing. Okay. Well, get your hands moving like this. That's the gas. This is a liquid. Liquid, they're in much closer proximity, but they have a lot of freedom compared to a solid, but not nearly as free as gases. All right. So the three different phases, solid, liquid, and gas, that these phase changes are physical changes, not chemical changes, right? Because nothing happens to the H2O molecule. We don't break bonds, make bonds. We're not combining anything. This is just its physical change from a solid to a liquid to a gas. But if you were down at the molecular level, if you were looking at the individual molecules of H2O, you might not see any difference between a liquid, solid, and a gas. At the individual molecular level, the individual molecules don't experience any difference. What is happening, though? There's less motion because there's more crowding. Think of it that way. There's crowding. As we go from solid to liquids and gases, it changes how close one molecule is to its neighbor. Its density changes. Okay. How tightly packed the molecules are. And in most cases, except for water and a few exceptions, the most densely packed of all three phases is the solid phase. I mean, that makes sense, right? It's hard. It's, it appears to us to be solid. And solid to us means more tightly packed. Packed together, you can't move. Remember that every single element on the periodic table, and the periodic table represents every element that, we're, that we know of, so everything that we know of exists in all three phases. It exists as a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So if I say, is calcium a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Your response is, yes. Is calcium a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Yes. If I said, in this experiment, is it a solid, liquid, or gas? You might say, I need more information. I need to know the pressure and the temperature. Because the pressure and the temperature are going to tell me whether or not each element is a solid, liquid, and gas based upon its boiling point or its freezing point. Because we think of freezing point as being 0 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but that's only for water. You know, this weekend we went camping, a little brisk, we had a good time. We put some antifreeze in the car. So, of course, I had to turn that into a chemistry lesson with Will and say, why aren't we adding straight water into the radiator? Why, Hot Rod? Why don't we add straight water into the radiator? Hmm? Why don't we? Why don't we just put water in the radiator? How do, why do we keep it cool so you can go run, 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 80 miles an hour down Dixie? Do you think the temperature of the car is greater than the boiling point of water? Okay, next time you do your 80 miles down Dixie, I dare you to go out and put your hands on the block. You'll leave skin behind. It's so hot. Okay? Is the engine warmer than the boiling point of water? Absolutely it is. Your engine is much hotter than 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. And yet... You still have coolant 
in your car. It doesn't boil off. Why? Because typically it's a 50-50 water glycanol mix. Water boils at 212 Fahrenheit, 100 Celsius. But if you put glycanol in it, it raises the boiling point and it lowers the freezing point, which is why you can go out to your car in the winter when it's been below freezing all night long, start it up and not have a frozen block is because you haven't reached the freezing point of the water glycanol mixture. You've only reached the freezing point of water. But you're not dealing with water. You're dealing with the water glycanol mix. Okay? So we alter the water so that it's no longer straight water, so that its freezing point and boiling point are different, and so that it can stay a liquid between the cool and the hot points, given the pressures and temperatures. Given the temperature of your engine and the pressure within the cooling system, it remains a, a liquid. And you need it to remain a liquid so it'll flow. If it becomes a solid, it's frozen, you're going to blow the engine. If it boils off, you're going to overheat, you're going to blow the engine. And no more racing down Dixie Highway. Okay. So the point being that everything is, exists in all three phases. Everything is a solid, everything is a liquid, and everything is a gas at different places in terms of temperature and pressure. So again, the question being, is... Oxygen, a solid, a liquid, or a gas? And your answer would be yes, or your answer would be, I need more information. Is oxygen a solid, liquid, or gas at standard temperature and pressure? Oh, that's different. Standard temperature and pressure is where we live. This is where we feel comfortable. This much air pushing down on me, and this temperature, you know, about this temperature. So between our normal boiling and freezing point of water, let's say, in that range we feel comfortable living, okay? Or maybe even less, between, let's say, 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. We, we live in that area. We know these different elements to be certain things. If I said, hey, go get me some calcium right now, you would expect to find a powder. If I said, give me some nitrogen, you would expect to go over and find a bottle full of nitrogen gas. Why? At this temperature and pressure, we're used to seeing those elements in those phases. But... Every element can exist in all three phases. And again, talking about theoretical absolute zero, as we go towards absolute zero, as volume decreases, everything eventually becomes a solid. As a matter of fact, everything freezes solid, including the electrons. And that's why it gets to a place where like, we don't understand how that can be yet. Right, we don't. But think of it just in terms of the element. Everything can become a solid eventually, if you go cold enough. And everything becomes a gas as you become warm enough. Iron, does it exist as a gas? Yes, at the right temperature and pressure. We know it as a solid. We may even know it as a liquid when we melt it. We, we're not used to pressures and temperatures that are high enough to make it into a gas. But it exists as a gas in some places. Gaseous iron. Okay. So again, the phase is based upon the amount of energy that's in it and what kind of energy it takes to move it from the, from the individual molecules or atoms to be close together, to relatively close but having freedom, to being a gas. Adding energy moves every element or substance from a solid to a liquid to a gas in that way. As I said, most things, most things are dense, less dense, and even less dense. What do I mean by that? No, I don't mean you can't learn for the exam. Like, he's never going to learn. He's so dense. That's not what I mean. Okay. What I mean is how much material is in a given volume of space. If I have a solid of something and I have a, a certain amount, let's say, just for arbitrary things, let's pretend that this is a objective volume, I have a handful, okay? I have a double handful of something. If I have a double handful of, of an element and it's in its solid form, if I have a handful of it, and I take that same amount of material and I move it into a liquid form, for most things, but not including water, how much space does it have? How much space does it take? If I'm holding a perfect handful of a solid and I add energy to it to heat it up so it becomes a liquid, what would I expect to happen to the amount in my hand? What would happen to that? It'd be a greater amount, so what would happen to the, in my hand? Overflow, right? So I have a certain amount of, of material, stuff, remember, matter, stuff, 
I have a certain amount of stuff and it's in solid form, if I have a perfect handful and I add energy to it, which would be like melting it, as I melt it, for most everything, I would then have more than I could hold and it would overflow. And then as I went from that to a gas, it would even expand even more. And it would expand so much that the individual atoms and molecules would no longer be in proximity to each other, no longer touching each other. They would get so much air between them, they would, they would appear to disappear. Right? They would appear to disappear because they're so separate. As a solid, they're so tight. As a liquid, they're close, but they're moving. As a gas, they're distant from one another. And again, they appear to disappear. It doesn't mean they actually do. The, again, there is no chemical change that's taking place there. It's all physical. It's how close they are to one another. Now, water is the exception, and we tend to know water. So remember, as you think through this, water is the exception. If I ask you, if you have liquid water and you freeze water, does it become smaller or larger, the same amount? If I put a certain amount in a container and I put it in the freezer, after it freezes, will I have more volume or less volume? Uh, it'll take up more volume. The same amount of material will take up more volume for water because it's an exception. Water, water and there's a few other elements too, but water is the main exception. Okay? And it do, it's due to hydrogen bonding. So we're not going to go into a lot of depth in that. But for water, if I have like your pool, if you have a pool, if you, left, if you didn't put the water level down and it froze, it theoretically, the water level in the pool would rise, or the ice level would rise to the top of the pool, or could overflow the pool, right? Because as water freezes, it expands. As it melts, it contracts. And then as it goes to gas, it expands again. So water is one of those anomalies. Gas condenses to liquid and then freezes, it expands to ice. Everything else starts small as a solid, expands to liquid, expands to ice. And I said everything else, but virtually everything else. There are a few other substances. It's all due to hydrogen bonding. So you need to know those differences. Water behaves one way, virtually everything else, and for your purposes, assume, unless told otherwise, that it's everything else, okay? So if you say, for example, there's a question here on page 214. It says, cubes of frozen rubbing alcohol are put into liquid rubbing alcohol. Will the cubes float or sink? Let's think about that. I have cubes of rubbing alcohol. Now, you guys have seen rubbing alcohol before, right? It's always a liquid. Is rubbing alcohol a solid, liquid, or a gas? Yes. Here, it's telling us it's a solid. So the temperature-pressure combination must be such that the molecules of rubbing alcohol have come closer together and transitioned into that phase where they're vibrating and not moving relative to one another. So we have a container of rubbing alcohol. And I always put waves in it just so you can remember it's a liquid. But there is no like wave machine in there, okay? And then we put uh, cubes of rubbing alcohol in liquid rubbing alcohol. What's going to happen? Now let's remember that water is an exception. So if I have another cup over here, And this is water. That's rubbing alcohol, okay? If I've got a cup here that has water in it, bad cup, I know, I did it real quick. But I put an ice cube in it, what's going to happen? The ice cube is going to float, right? It's going to float some above and some below, but it's going to float at the l top level. If Because this is the exception, if I put solid rubbing alcohol in liquid rubbing alcohol, what would end up happening? It would sink to the bottom. Okay? It would sink to the bottom. Why? Because in water, liquid expands to become solid for water, which means its density is lower. The density of ice is less than the density of liquid water. Okay, Way to think of it. The same amount takes up more space. Or in the same space, you get less stuff. Two ways to think about it. So as you go from a liquid to a solid for water, its density 
decreases. And so when you put substances together, it's as simple as this. The least dense thing goes to the top, and the most dense thing pushes its way to the bottom. Okay. Over here, in water, since, since ice is less dense than liquid, the less dense goes up and the more dense goes down. Think of it two ways. This ice cube is floating or the water is pushing underneath it. And it gets to a point of equilibrium where the force underneath it actually pushes it slightly above the top level. Okay? Over here in alcohol, the solid is more dense than the liquid, so the solid's going to sink to the bottom. The denser is going to go to the bottom. In fact, we get into this idea of density on page 217. Page 217, the equation for density is rho equals m, m divided by v, which is simply the density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. I believe we've done this before because, again, the other addition does this in slightly different order. Second edition does it slightly different than third edition. But the idea here for density, density is the mass divided by the volume. Often the units are grams per milliliter or possibly grams per cubic centimeter. Saying the same thing, right? A cubic centimeter is a milliliter. Grams, that's a measure of mass, how much stuff do we have, divided by volume. So how much stuff for a given volume do we have? That's what the units of density are, grams per milliliter. And the, those uh, substances with the greater density, when put in proximity to one another, the greater density is going to move lower. The lesser density is going to move up. Classic example is Italian dressing. Put the oil, the water. Okay, not quite the same as we did the other day with our, with our drinking tubes, right? But putting oil and water together and you shake them up, the oil always ends up going to the top and the water or the vinegar whichever you're mixing, goes to the bottom. Why is that? The substance with the, the less density, the lighter density, you might be thinking of it, the, the less dense is a technical way to say it. The less dense material goes to the top. It rises. Why? There's more space between the molecules. There's less stuff. I know it doesn't sound technical, but there literally is less stuff for every unit of volume. There's less stuff, it rises. There's more stuff, it's denser. Think of a, a, a ball that's a softball size, and one of them, a softball made out of, you know, let's just say we have a softball that's made out of foam and a softball that's made out of lead. They're the same volume, but which has more stuff in it? The lead is heavier because it has more mass. It has more mass, meaning it has more stuff, meaning there's more things to react to the pull of gravity on it. It has more weight. Okay, so the denser, often if it's the same size, it comes across to us as feeling heavier because it's denser. It's got more stuff for the same size. In the book, they give the definition of density on 217 as an object's mass divided by the volume that the object occupies. It takes up this much space, and has this much stuff in that space. So a unit of density is how much stuff it has divided by how much space it takes. And you can compare different things. Different objects have different specific densities. Different objects do. For example, on page 219, example 6-1, it says a miner has just found a nugget of pure gold. He measures its dimensions and then calculates its volume to be 0 0.125 liters. Okay. Let me make some space here. This miner finds gold. He takes its dimensions to find its volume. Its volume is going to be either its, if it was a perfect rectangular type shape, you could just go do the height times depth times length, you know, do the multiply those three things together and get units. Or he may have had a graduated cylinder or something like that where he could take his object, drop it in the liquid, and notice the change in the level. Did we do that in here? Take like a graduated cylinder and set its level. Then take an object and drop it inside and watch the level rise. Okay. But what would happen would be you take a marble in a graduated cylinder. Let's say it's set at 98 milliliters. 
We take the marble, we drop it in, it rises to 100 milliliters. What is the volume of the marble? Two milliliters, right? Whatever volume it's changed, you've added that volume to the substance, it's raised that much. So you take a liquid, you measure its volume, you drop it in. So let's say here the, the miner finds this nugget, he takes a graduated cylinder, he reads a level, he drops the nugget in the water, the level changes a certain volume. That's the volume of the thing you put in, is the change in the volume level. He read whatever reason however he did it the volume is equal to 0 0.125 liters and we know that the density of gold the row of gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter What's the mass of the nugget? How much, what would be the mass of the nugget? If we put the nugget on a triple beam balance, what would our mass be? Right? We rearrange the formula. Rho is mass divided by volume. So mass, which we're trying to solve for, right? How much mass does this nugget have? It's going to have its density times the volume. The density of gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter. Our volume is 0 0.125 liters. Are we done? I mean, a mass is rho times volume, rho v. Rho is 19.3 grams per milliliter, and the volume is 0 0.125 liters. Are we done? Can we just do the math now? What would our units be, Ray, if we did the math right now? So we've got grams, milliliters, and liters, right? Our units now would be gram liters per milliliter. Is that a measure of mass? We want grams all by itself, right? So we need to get rid of milliliters and liters. And how are we going to do that? One thousand milliliters is equal to one liter, right? We could, if we're savvy enough, we could have skipped that step by saying it's 19.3 grams for every one milliliter times and then convert that to milliliters on the fly. 0.125 liters is the same as 125 milliliters. Okay, that's the same thing as this times this. Those cancel. So 19.3 times 125, which according to the book is 2,412.5 grams. So again, with the formula, the density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. Rearrange it for the unknown, plug in what you're given, and if necessary, change units. In this case, changing from liters to milliliters. On 220, on your own 6.5, the density of silver. Density of silver is 10.5 grams 
per cent cubic centimeter. A jeweler makes a silver bracelet out of 0.2 kilograms. What's the bracelet's volume? It's actually the, of the silver. Well, you want to get volume all by itself on one side of the equal sign, right? Okay. So how are we going to rearrange this formula to solve for volume? Well, the shorthand would be just sliding across the diagonal, which would be V is, excuse me, V is equal to M over rho. Okay. Long way to think about it is this. I need to get rid of. I'm going to do this. I need to get v all by itself over here, or on one side or the other, right? In the numerator. One side or the other in the numerator. If I multiply both sides by v, that cancels, and I'm left with v rho equals m. And now I need to get v all by itself, so I divide both sides by rho, and v equals m rho. Or you can look at it and say, hmm, let me just swap them. Let me just move diagonally across the equal sign. Because I can, I come up with this, the v rho, this would be rho, equals m by putting this up to here. And then I come up with this by moving the row down to there. So either way, whether you know the shortcut by sliding diagonally across the equal sign or whether you've got to go through the whole process, you need to be able to rearrange this to solve for the unknown variable. And here the unknown variable is the volume. What's the volume of the bracelet? So volume is mass divided by rho, which is equal to 0 0.200 kilograms divided by 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter. So what is my issue? Just like in the last one, right? What are my units of mass? I'm dividing kilograms by grams. I need to have the same units to do the math, right? I can't divide because I'll end up with a derived unit that has mass over mass. I could We can go either way. Which way do you want to go? Do you want to go to grams or kilograms? If we go to kilograms, we're going to have 0 0.200 kilograms divided by converting grams to kilograms, right? So it's going to be 1, 2, 3. Okay, so I convert 10.5 grams and it becomes 0 0.0105 kilograms. Now when I do this math, what are my units going to be? It's going to be cubic centimeters, right? Kilograms are going to cancel kilograms. My units are going to be 1 over 1 over cubic centimeters. 
which is the same as cubic centimeters. Remember, dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. Okay, so it's going to be cubic centimeters. So whatever the math here is, 200 divided by 10.5, basically. So a little less than 20 cubic centimeters. So if I had a graduated cylinder, and I had that bracelet, and I measured out the volume, and I dropped the bracelet in, the level would rise approximately 20, a little less than 20 cubic centimeters, or 20 milliliters. Why? Because I know I had, I had silver that had this density, and I used this much of it. So this much of it with that density means I've got that much space of silver that I need. Now that, if I were to melt it, if I were to, you know, um, even hyper, you know, change it from a solid to a liquid, but then even change it from a liquid to a gas, the volumes change. This is talking about solid silver. Solid silver has this density, and we use that much of it. the hardest part of this problem. And don't say Monday morning is the hardest part of the problem, or first period is the hardest part of the problem, or the temperature in the room is the hardest part of the problem. But what is the conceptually, what's the hardest part of this problem? Rearranging the formula. This going from this to this is the hardest part of the. Okay. Remember to get the same units. Those are really the only two parts of the problem, aren't they? Getting the formula, or we have to know the formula, which they only have one or two formulas per module. So you have the formula for density, how to arrange the formula, but it's really about how to rearrange any formula, right? Because if we talked before about converting Fahrenheit to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit, we've talked about other formulas in the past, it's just a matter of rearranging those formulas. So how do you rearrange a formula? Which is not chemistry, right? This is math. So the hard part about this, that's, that's math. Keeping the units the same, is that technically chemistry? Isn't that just, let's say, conscientiousness, right? Like keeping, keeping things the same. So that you, and it's really a math principle more than it is a, a chemistry principle. The idea here, of the, all the chemistry stuff is really in your head. Does that make sense by knowing what it means for something to have density, and that the density is the m amount of matter in a given volume, and how those things relate. That this is this divided by this. But having a formula with three variables, knowing two of them, to be able to solve for the unknown. Okay. Let's go ahead and walk through the similar, on your own, 6.6. .6. A gold miner tries to sell some gold that he found in a nearby river. The person who is thinking about purchasing the gold measures the mass and the volume of one nugget. The mass is 1.54 kilograms. And the volume is 0 0.080 liters. Is this nugget really made of gold? You're going to go, I don't know. Well, remember that the density of gold is nineteen point three grams per milliliter. Okay. So conceptually, what are we going to do? What are, what are we trying to do? Mm-hmm. Mm -mm. 
It'll be given to you if you need it. So gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter in its solid form, okay? Solid gold. Solid gold is 19.3 grams per milliliter. Is this nugget gold? What are we going to do? What, conceptually, not the, not the process. What are we going to do? What are we trying to... How will we know if this is gold or not? We're good. Find the density of whatever this is. What's called a stone. You've got a stone. Is the stone gold or not? Don't know. Let's find out the density of the stone. And if the density of the stone is equal to the density of gold, the stone is gold. Right? If the density of the stone is not the same as gold, the stone's not gold. It's got to be something else. But it's not gold. So that's what we're, we're doing here. Is the nugget really made of gold? Is the density of the rock the same as the density of gold? If it is, it's gold. If it's not, it's something else. Now that again assumes it's pure. It's all the same thing. You know, it's not like a one of those pieces of candy that's got a certain shell but it's different on the middle. We're assuming it's the same thing throughout. Okay, that's part of the caveat. Say, so, but whatever it is, 19.3 grams per milliliter, is this gold? So we know that the row of gold is 19.3, but in our stone, right here, what we're looking at, it's going to the mass divided by the volume. The mass divided by the volume, it's 1.3. 5, 4 kilograms divided by 0 0.080 liters. Now, are we doing ourselves any favor when we're looking at rho? What's our units going to be if we just do the math here? Kilograms per liter, right. And we're going to be comparing that to grams per milliliter. Do you want to do the, do do the math changes now or later? We've got to do it sometime, right? So if it's grams per milliliter, why not get that in grams per milliliter? We need, to, we need to do that. So let's take care of converting the kilograms first. One kilogram is how many grams? Right? One kilogram is 1,000 grams. I was looking at the units, not 19.3. Grams. One gram, 1,000 grams is one kilogram. Now if I did the math, I would end up with kilograms, cancels kilograms, and I've got grams per liter. We're not looking for grams per liter, we're looking for grams per milliliter. So now I need to get rid of the liters. I do that by putting one liter, and what is it equal to in milliliters? It's a thousand milliliters, right? Oh, guess what? Grams... Kilograms is grams times a thousand, liters is milliliters times a thousand, it would have been the same. See, because we have to multiply the numerator by a thousand, but we have to multiply the denominator by a thousand, and these will cancel each other out. But don't assume it will. I'd much rather have you do this work and know that it does. To know that liters here, liters cancels liters, and I'm left with milliliters, and kilograms cancels kilograms, and I'm left with grams. And so my units are going to be grams per milliliter. Grams per milliliter. Okay, good. It works. Now I can go, okay, 1,000 cancels 1,000, and I'm actually left with this math right here. 1.54 divided by 0 0.080. Somebody with a, with a calculator. I was going to say with a phone, but I'm not trying to catch you. Okay. Somebody with a calculator. Want to do that for me? Or... Since it isn't on your own, I don't always trust the answers to the on your owns, by the way, if you haven't figured that out. The book. Nineteen point two five. Is it gold? Or can you handle it? 
What's our highest number of significant figures, right? Because it's sig figs, because we're multiplying and dividing. Sig figs, right? So when we, when we multiply or divide, it's our what? Our answer can only be, it's not precision. Precision is adding and subtracting. Your answer can only have as many significant figures as the least significant figures of any one of your factors. How many significant figures? One, two, three. Three sig figs. This one has four, or excuse me, three. Right? One, two, trailing zero has three. So three. How many sig figs are here? Four. Can't have four. You can only have three. One, two, here. We need to make a decision. What do we do? Round up or leave it the same? Have to round up. So this goes to 19.3 grams per milliliter. Is the stone gold? Yes, it's gold. Why? It has the same density as gold. We say any different, you have to get within the precision and significant figures. Trust me, if, if you're given something and I was trying to say, is it gold or is it not gold? And you did the math, you're not going to have 19.1 and go, no. It's going to be like 23, 25. Give you something where there's Obviously, a difference. Mm -hmm. All right. We are up to page 221. And in 221, they start talking about the phase changes in water. And we've already done that. Because when we talk about freezing and boiling and we compare it to water, we've already talked about that about the phase changes of water. So we are about to begin chemical reactions and chemical equations. This is going to lead us into stoichiometry. And stoichiometry is stoichiometry. Stoichiometry. And this is chemistry. We're just about to get into chemistry. Real chemistry. Okay? We're just about to get, in, get into, I have this and this that react to produce this and this. And if we, know the re if we know how to write the equations, we begin to learn to understand how much we need of each one of the reactants to produce a certain amount of each one of the products. And then we're going to start with atoms of them, and then go on to moles of them, and then go on to liters of them, and different ways of understanding how many of them we have. Ultimately, all chemical reactions come down to the molecular level of how many for one to how many of another.